Thursday and Friday, noon, Saturday and Sunday. There's some great entertainment, just to name a few. Dennis Quaid and the Sharks, Bretton Woods, Rick Springfield, Ambrosia, and Winona Judd. Carnival rides for the kids, vendors for all to enjoy, and a beer garden for the adults. Use the free shuttle from the Beaumont Walmart or Beaumont Sports Park and get a dollar off admission. See you there. The Inner Voice Show is a dialogue between the host and the listeners about their relationships. This show is not an attempt to assess, diagnose, or treat any mental health or illness condition. Please consult your physician, psychiatrist, or psychotherapist for personal matters. Inner Voice. A heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fujian Zay and have Sean in studio. This is a show about what matters most in your life, our mind, thoughts, feelings, actions, relationships, and our fulfillment in this beautiful journey of life. Now, in this show, I'll bring you the latest research from Pennsylvania State University about not giving up on your goals. It would minimize your depression, anxiety, and panic. And then I will speak to Tom Bunn. Uh, he's a licensed uh, social worker, clinical social worker, and he's the author of the book, Panic Free, the 10-day program to end the panic, anxiety, and claustrophobia. How? Huh. That's beautiful. It's an amazing book. I read it and it's great. So it has um, a lot of beautiful techniques and uh, hints to give you. And you can call us and talk to us with either uh, me or um, Tom Bunn, 951-922-3532. We'd love to hear from you. And we'll be right back with the tip of the week. Join the conversation every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific for Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Dr. Fujian is a radio and TV host, international speaker, psychotherapist, life coach, and the author of Life Reset, The Awareness Path to Create the Life You Want. She brings you the latest research and interviews with experts in the field of cognitive sciences. Anyone who loves to grow and create growth for humanity gets a voice on this call-in show. Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Monday afternoons at 3 p.m. PM Pacific on Smart Talk KMT 1490 AM and on KMT 1490 AM dot com. So welcome back. Um, this is the tip of the week. Now this week I was really witnessing among my friends, myself, my clients in my office, um, the duality that we all as human beings live into constantly. Dualities that we create actually for ourselves. It's normal, I know, but it's stressful and uh, sometimes life-changing depending on what type of actions we do and which one of the dualities we kind of choose to go on and act on. So some of the ones that I was facing this week, um, should I choose comfort over productivity? Should I get up and do things or just eh, choose my comfort, sleep, watching TV, going through my phone with social media? These are not just mine. I'm talking, I've really witnessed it also with others and my clients. Should I choose um, the food that appeals to my taste buds? And I, oh, they're not good for me, but who cares? I just want it right now. Or choose the ones that are more nur nurturing and nutritious. Should I choose death over courage to face my life and make the effort to change my life? Should I choose um, a sexual, emotionally charged fling over working on years of marriage? Should I choose revenge versus letting my ego go and uh, just say, it's okay. I got it. I'm upset. Um, I felt um, unfair but I'm not going to take revenge. I'm just going to let it go. These are all, you know, the dualities that we face. And I'm sure if you look at your life and even this past week, you could look at all the different um, things that were kind of opposing part of you. 
and they were gnawing at you constantly in life. So somehow we want the most emotionally pleasantly charged path with no regards to the long-term consequence. We want to have what is um, more fulfilling for us and tastes good and feels good right now. And um, it might have consequences, but I don't want to think about it because the emotion of joy and excitement pulls me in and the, you know, I'll deal with it later. But then when we actually have to deal with the consequences, then we come back in hindsight. I'm like, why did I do that? I know better. I shouldn't be doing that, but that's what we do. So having the, having the both of, you know, the better world of both worlds, um, and not having the consequences at all would be a nice fantasy. It just doesn't happen that way. So how do we resolve our draw dilemmas? Looking at the benefits and the cost or the price of the consequence of each side. So kind of maybe even writing them down. I really like writing them down, putting them on a paper. And if you don't have to make that decision right then, you can even kind of keep writing for about a week. If you're in a restaurant and you have to make a choice right there, maybe you can't sit there and write it down. But with almost every other duality that's not eminent and you don't have to do it right there, you could take some time and take care of yourself. Look at the benefits of each side. What is it that I want from each side? How would it benefit me short term and long term? And then please write also the cost, the price you have to pay, the consequences that you actually have to pay for each side. And be honest. Don't minimize or maximize. Just be honest. Just keep writing. So look at the matters rationally, even though sometimes the rational part does not have the joy of the intense emotion and uh, it's not highly charged. And then we could, if we choose the rational side and we're like, oh, it's blah. Why should I eat this food or why should I do this? And, um, and it's kind of like blah. And we're letting go of the pleasurable intense, charged, but not good thing for us, maybe what we could do is to assign adding some positive emotions to the rational solution by looking back at some memory that we've had, that we've really previously have had a positively emotionally charged memories, and you can attach those positive emotions to maybe this rational side, rational side. So it's logical, it's okay, and then maybe we could add the good emotions to it. Then we can visualize the positive outcome and the effect that is there. Um, and look at the benefits that if we just wait and do this rational thing that we said we were gonna do and um, attach the positive memories and feelings around it, and then kind of like throw it in the future and assign that into the future so that the future calls us forward. So we get excited about doing this and um, also attaching negative emotions to the other uh, consequences of the other dualities that we didn't want for, such as if I'm eating something that it's tasty, but it's not good for me. Maybe I can attach, uh, think about it, that it's not good for me and uh, remember the stomachache that I would have or uh, get fat and I look at the mirror and I don't like it and go through it and put, assign those negative emotions to um, the negative parts that I don't want to do. This way, it might make easier for you to actually make the right choices for yourself, which can have the long-term benefits and less of your consequences. How about that? Let's think about it. Let's do it. And then let me know how that works for you. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with the latest research from Pennsylvania State University.
Hello, I'm Dr. Fujian, and I have great news for you. I'm offering a special time-limited offer to anyone who's interested in online therapy or coaching sessions. I've developed the awareness integration model, which allows in only 12 weeks to raise your self-esteem and confidence and let go of your thoughts and emotions that produce depression and anxiety for you. So call today to schedule your online session and save $600. Call me today at 818-648-2140. That's 818-648-2140. Or go to www.fujan.com. Welcome back to the Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fujan Zain, and this is the latest research on people who don't give up on their goals or who get better over time at not giving up on their goals and who have a positive outlook appear to have less anxiety and depression and fewer panic attacks. According to a study of thousands of Americans over the course of 18 years, surprisingly, a sense of control did not have an effect on the mental health of the participants across time. The study was done in the Pennsylvania State University and published by the American Psychological Association in the Journal of Abnormal Psychology. They say, perseverance cultivates a sense of purposefulness that can create resilience against or decrease current levels of major depression disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, and panic disorder. Looking at the bright side of unfortunate events has the same effects because people feel that life is meaningful, understandable, and manageable. Depression, anxiety, and panic disorders are common mental health disorders that can be chronic and debilitating, debilitating and put a person's physical health and livelihood at risk. Often, people with these disorders are stuck in a cycle of negative thought patterns and behaviors that can make them feel worse. So in this study, Scholars wanted to understand what specific coping strategies would be helpful in reducing rates of depression, anxiety, and panic attacks. Now, they used data from 3,294 adults who were studied over 18 years. The average age of participants was 45. Nearly all were white and slightly fewer than half were college educated. Data were collected three times in 1995 to 1996, 2004 to 2005, and 2012 to 2013. At each interval, participants were asked to rate their goal persistence, um, such as, when I encounter problems, I don't give up until I solve them, or self-mastery, I can do, just do anything I really set my mind to, and positive reappraisal, such as, I can find something positive even in the worst situation. So diagnosis for major depression, anxiety, and panic disorders were also collected at each interval. So people who showed more goal persistence and optimism during the first assessment in the mid-1990s had greater reductions in depression, anxiety, and panic disorders across the 18 years, according to the authors. Now, throughout those years, people began with fewer mental health problems, showed more increased perseverance toward life goals, and were better at focusing on the positive side of the unfortunate events. These findings suggest that people can improve their mental health by raising and maintaining high levels of tenacity, resilience, and optimism. Aspiring toward personal and career goals can make people feel like their lives have meaning. On the other hand, Disengaging from striving toward those aims or having cynical attitude can have high mental health costs. Unlike in previous research, this research did not find that self-mastery or feeling in control of one's faith had an effect on the mental health participants across the 18-year period. This could have been because, um, because the participants, on average, did not show any changes in their use of self-mastery over time. It is possible that self-mastery is a relatively stable part of a person's character that does not easily change. Now, I have seen that across um, my work with people for 30 years, that 
uh, depression means having no hope for the future. So obviously, if you have a goal that is set up for the future and you're striving toward it, it takes away that hopelessness and helplessness that causes um, depression. When you have a positive goal and you have a positive outcome that you're working toward, it takes away a lot of the negative uh, future thoughts of anxiety. What if, what if, what if, because you are set around your goal and you're moving forward. So I could really see how um, I've experienced that research actually within the 30 years with my clients and with myself. Great. Now, guess who we're going to talk to? Tom Bunn. He's a licensed clinical social worker and is the author of Panic Free, the 10-day program to end panic, anxiety, and claustrophobia, which is the result of his many years addressing flight panic in his role as an airline pilot. He's a captain. He's also a licensed therapist, regular contributor to Psychology Today, and a former U.S. Air Force captain who flew the Air Force's first supersonic jet fighter, the F-100. So don't go anywhere. I'm excited to have Tom Bunn. We'll be right back. You've got a new life now, you're free from our old times. I can understand how it was all I knew a lie. We could live all we ever dreamed. You could just wake up one day, reach across your nightstand, and hit the life reset button. Let's face it, the struggles and frustrations of everyday life leave millions of women and men around the globe yearning for a new way. And the new way is right here in Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want by Dr. Fujan Zain. You can get it now at fujan.com or amazon.com. Life Reset the awareness integration path to create the life you want. You deserve it. Hello, I'm Dr. Fujan, and I have great news for you. I'm offering a special time-limited offer to anyone who's interested in online therapy or coaching sessions. I've developed the awareness integration model, which allows in only 12 weeks to raise your self-esteem and confidence and let go of your thoughts and emotions that produce depression and anxiety for you. So call today to schedule your online session and save $600. Call me today at 818-648-2140. That's 818-648-2140. Or go to www.fujan.com. Join the conversation every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific for Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Dr. Fujian is a radio and TV host, international speaker, psychotherapist, life coach, and the author of Life Reset, The Awareness Path to Create the Life You Want. She brings you the latest research and interviews with experts in the field of cognitive sciences. Anyone who loves to grow and create growth for humanity gets a voice on this call-in show. Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Monday afternoons at 3 p.m 
p.m. Pacific on Smart Talk KMET 1490 AM and on KMET 1490 AM.com. You're listening to Inner Voice. I'm Dr. Fujian Zain, and I am so excited to speak with Tom Bunn, the author of Panic Free, the 10 day program to end panic, anxiety, and claustrophobia. I want you to all see this book. Welcome to my show, Tom. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here and get some word out that we can fix panic a lot better than we used to be able to. Yes. So first, let's tell people what panic is. So let's do that. And this is, comes from your book. Page okay. 10, everyone. Page 10. So before you start, is to tell you a little bit about the symptom of panic. Don't panic as I'm giving you the symptoms of panic, though. Palpitation, pounding heart, accelerated heart rate, sweating, trembling or shaking, sensations of shortness of breath or suffocation, feelings of choking, chest pain or discomfort, mm -hmm. nausea mm -hmm. or abdominal distress, mm -hmm. feeling dizzy, unsteady, lightheaded, faint, chills or hot flashes, numbness or tingling sensations. I see a lot of that in my clients. Feelings of unreality, derealization, yeah. feelings of being detached from oneself, fear of losing control or going crazy, fear of dying. Yes. So these are the symptoms. And you decided to write about it and actually work on them because you were um, doing well, a lot of the fights and teaching people and they yeah, were panicking. Yeah, the main thing that for fear of flying is fear of panic attack on the plane where you have no way to get out and you're stuck with it maybe for hours. Um, the things that we um, were trying to do originally using CBT, um, well, people who started to panic on the plane at least, when they started to get revved up, they didn't have any cognition available to do any of our cognitive tools with. So it became pretty obvious that if we were going to fix it, it was going to have to be something that would work automatically. Yes. So there were other people who had the same notion. Uh, one therapist tried thought stopping with a rubber band on your wrist, snap it, and whenever you have an anxiety provoking thought, so that would maybe inhibit the thought. And I thought, well, what about something a little bit more sophisticated, such as redirecting thoughts? So Let's say that as soon as you think about your plane taking off, you shift your thought automatically, habitually to something, some big deal that you've done. And I had a person who was a marathon runner. So I said, OK, every time I give you this hand signal, I want you to go step, step, step back to running the marathon. So I'd say, OK, the plane's taking off. And then I'd give her the signal. She would go to the marathon. The plane's landing. So we would do 20 or 30 scenes from a routine flight link it to quickly to take her to run the marathon. She did okay, but I tried it with other people, it didn't work. Then I had a woman who says, I'm going to link it to nursing my child. And mm -hmm. I thought, you got to be crazy. You're going to get on the plane and think you'll never see your child again. She called back a week later, said she had an absolutely perfect flight. Wow. And, and I figured it was just a fluke, but it happened again and again. And finally, I figured I got to check this out. Something's going on here. But getting we're getting better results nursing a baby than anything else. Sue Carter, who's a big expert on oxytocin in the U.S., had discovered it about this time, that when a mother nurses, she produces a huge amount of oxytocin, which continues all the time that she's nursing. It's nature's way of making sure that halfway through she doesn't get anxious and figures she should do something else. Just shuts down the fear system. So that was the first breakthrough. Then we had to figure, what do we do for people who haven't had that experience? And there's other situations that produce oxytocin. So then we got just Pavlovian about it. Pavlov fed his dogs and rang the bell a few times, and then he could get them to salivate just by ringing the bell. So what we wanted to do, let's let the various things that happen during the flight be the bell, and that will then trigger oxytocin. So that worked pretty well. But then Stephen Porges came up with an explanation of why some of the things were working uh, that weren't about oxytocin, such as wedding vows or a moment with a friend who's particularly calming. He stumbled on the discovery that the parasympathetic nervous system is activated mainly by being with another person whose face, 
particularly around the eyes, is sending you signals unconsciously that you're safe with them, not right. just physically, but also emotionally. They're not judgmental at all. So you don't have to be on walking on eggshells with them. Some of the signals come across in the quality of their voice and some in their body language and touch. So then we had two things to work with. Oxytocin that shuts down the fear system and using the parasympathetic nervous system, the calming system, by linking the things that happen on the plane to the face, voice, and touch of a person who's safe emotionally and physically to be with. So let's go over this a little bit just to open it up. Um, what are the uh, reasons that panic starts? Is that... Well, yeah. Go ahead. Well, um, the amygdala. Yes. Uh, it, it's, it's a primitive, pretty primitive device even. I don't even... It seems like it's not really very mental. It's just kind of a knee-jerk reaction. It re reacts to feelings of dropping s-shaped things on the ground that might be a snake and to anything it does that we don't expect anything that surprises us so there's a lot of things that happen that we aren't expecting that we're not used to that will fire off the amygdala that are perfectly safe so according to porges's looking back at how this all developed he says that a couple of hundred million years ago the most advanced creatures were reptiles such as dinosaurs like a tyrannosaurus rex Huge creature has a brain about the size of a dog. Not a lot of smarts, but the amygdala, that was the key thing. When this huge creature would see some change, the amygdala would react, produce stress hormones. Stress hormones cause the urge to run. Off he goes. Nothing standing in the way. Then when mammals came on the scene, the brain got bigger. Now you've got a thinking part of the brain. So now when the amygdala fires off, the thinking part of the brain is also activated by the stress hormones, wakes you up. And so the thinking part of the brain says, hold off on that running. Let's take a look around and see if we really need to. Big advantage. So that's kind of where we are. But on an airplane, at least, when the stress hormones are released, maybe by a noise or by the plane feeling like it's dropping, you don't have much information to tell you that you're okay there. And sometimes uh, also on the ground, it seems like the information that the, the, uh, the person gives themselves looking at the future and the negativity that might happen, they can't turn it off. And I know that in your book, you also had uh, a, a place that says, you know, what is the distinct difference between how our body reacts into a real fear yeah. versus a perceived fear, where yeah. when it's a real fear, it has one shot of the adrenaline and just waits for you to act upon that, whatever you mm -hmm. need to do. Yeah. But mm -hmm. then when it's a perceived one, because there's really nothing out there and it's your own brain activating and kind of hallucinating all of these things, that it keeps shooting up these chemicals in your body and your body gets overactivated with all of the chemicals that are coming in so that um, you know the sympathetic response is of uh, acting and you can't really stop it until you tell yourself or with different versions of what you're offering to bring back and activate the parasympathetic, which is telling your body, okay, danger yeah. is gone, it's done, and uh, you can calm down right now. But what happens, it seems, is when you get an anxiety-provoking thought, that produces hormones, stress hormones, which tell you, hey, something's going on, which makes you think about what may be dangerous, which causes more stress hormones. So you get this vicious cycle that people get into. And for example, if a person has pounding heart, they might think, well, it's probably nothing, but they could also imagine it's a heart attack. Yes. Now, if the stress hormones shut down reflective function, our ability to recognize that we may be imagining something, um, a person then experiences the pounding heart as a heart attack. So they're sure that they're having a heart attack. And the next thing is they can't escape. They can't run from it. So there's your panic attack. Yes. Life-threatening situation, can't escape. There you go, panic. Yes. So one of the ways that I used to work with panic attack, and it actually worked. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I read your book, I'm like, oh, my God, awesome. I'm taking yours. Um, <laughs> it's that I used to, you know, I've done hypnosis for the past yeah. 25 years. And yeah. a lot of this kind of re-shifting uh, and uh, assigning something um, 
to, which is positive with emotion that are positive yeah. uh, in the future and, you know, taking them to the worst case scenario that they have and then calming them down and mm -hmm. bringing them in a transition into a great place, even with uh, fear of flying. I've had a lot of clients with fear of flying, which I did exactly the same thing with mm -hmm. guided imagery and hypnosis and, you know, installing all of the um, like positive thoughts in yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it worked. But one of the things that I think is brilliant about what I uh, read about your work was this concept of safety that obviously in the way that I was doing, it was also creating safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But this element of um, the love, acceptance, caring that creates that visual and uh, let's say kinesthetic yeah. type of um, visualization of someone that is a friend, someone is a loved one, some yeah. kind of memory of that. It brings such an instantaneous um, level to our body. I could really feel like you don't even have to work that hard. Like shows up immediately. <laughs> well, that, that's what happened with, with, with uh, uh, sh the guy who, discovered what we're talking about. He was doing study on heart rate variability, uh, Stephen Porges, and he had his subjects hooked up. And sure enough, he did what they ex he expected when they breathe in, the heart goes up. When they breathe out, the heart rate goes down, regulated by the vagus nerve. But he got a surprise. Some of the people hooked up to his equipment, a friend would walk by and their heart rate went down. He thought, what's going on here? So that's how he got interested in this. And now he took that into what he calls the social engagement system. Because let's say you meet a stranger and your first impulse because of the stress hormones being released is, I need to get out of here. But your high level thinking says, eh, they look okay. So that kind of creates a little tension. I need to feel like I want to get out of here, but I shouldn't be, I sh eh, I'll hang in here. But if you start talking with the person and you start picking up the signals that Porges is talking about from their face and their voice. That he says that he doesn't call it perception. He calls it neuroception because he says you don't perceive it at all. The only thing is it has an emotional effect mm -hmm. and it calms you if the signals it are does. good. It does. I was actually, as I was reading your book, thinking of, um, I'm sure you've read uh, Frankl's um, uh -huh. the, you know, Search for Meaning. For meaning, yeah. And for... A, all of you who are listening or watching us, uh, Viktor Frankl read, he was in the concentration camp and watching um, his uh, just people around him uh, be walked toward uh, death games and not coming back. And he started looking at what is going on around him that some people were panicking and some people were okay with all of that. And part of what he was talking about is the meaning that we give life and all yeah. of that. But the part that I was looking at is, well, for him, a lot of these stories that people created meaning for were actually looking at their loved ones, mm -hmm. looking at going back and, you know, holding on to their children or their family member who were waiting for them. And that the all of these kind of brought it together for me, which is, wow, the future of looking into love safety, being with a person who uh, warms your heart, uh, just creates such an amazing uh, softness that it really takes you away from the insecurities of that moment and puts you into this kind of like a cradle place, uh, let's say of an illusion at that time, or a temporary space where it could hold you until you do whatever you need to do in order to get to safety, let's say. Yeah, yeah. Well, what this is, if I understand Porges, it's about this person signaling you that that you're safe with me. Now, in a lot of social situations, we get signals that we are physically safe. We may not get signals that we're emotionally safe because particularly guys are competitive, but in some situations, people are, are critical and sometimes critical, but not saying it, but you still sense it. But what I'm looking for is the kind of moment where you feel your guard let down. That's ideal because when you feel your guard let down, the vagus nerve is getting fully stimulated.
And some people have felt that. Some people said, no, I've never had that experience. So if if you've had the experience of your guard letting down, that's an ideal candidate for you to link to in order to activate your calming system because that's a sign you're getting maximum calming from their face, voice, and touch. And then if you haven't had that experience of your guard letting down, um, then what about a person who's just a friend? Oftentimes we we don't we're looking for some big deal, and and the people who we are really safe to be with emotionally and physically often we don't really pay much attention to them because we're more interested in people who who are critical. Mm-hmm. But but if we have a person who's just kind of an ordinary kind of friend who is easygoing and doesn't criticize, they're just that kind of person. That kind of person activates our calming system. I don't know if you saw that about the research done in Arizona recently, but I thought it was fascinating. It's in the book, but we added it on just at the last minute because it's very recent. 102 people were put into an experiment where they were going to be stressed and they were going to be given three different interventions to see what their reaction to the intervention was. The first uh group well oh by the way the stressor putting your foot in 38 degree water (laughs) and then to see what that does to your blood pressure and heart rate (laughs) two people two people dropped out too much stress anyway but the first group they said distract yourself by thinking about what you were doing today Mm -hmm. and they tested them the second group think about Oh, by the way, they're all in romantic relationships, committed relationships. So the second group, they said, think about the person you're in relationship with. The third group had their significant other physically present. They did, of course, very well. But the amazing thing was the people who simply thought about their significant other did just as well. Yeah. So... We normally think we need to have someone with us when we're in a stressful situation. And sure, that helps. But if we can take that person's presence and link it up so that we can have them psychologically active, that can be helpful, too. And it may even be better than having them with us physically. If we connect them to the challenge directly, then they can intercept the problem before we even conscious of it. I would uh, I would agree with you that it's actually better if you think about them. I mean, it's nice to have them, but I've also have had people where uh, the romantic partner or their parents or, you know, people who were really uh, the symbol of love for them in the room. But as long as their vision inside the internal state, whatever they were thinking about and visualizing inside was still creating danger for them and they weren't really uh, connecting to the person who was person. in front of them yeah. it was yeah it didn't work but if the if they actually bring it inside of them and that's who they're thinking that the person is their mother or mate or you know a great friend holding them and putting them into a safe place that visualization it seems like it works then more than even somebody being around them i remember when i was uh working with um biofeedback yeah and uh one of the things that i keep thinking was if i keep telling myself relax relax you know sometimes i was driving and then i would get this kind of like a dizziness and i would get into panic like what's going to happen in the middle of the freeway so (laughs) i would get myself on, on the side and i would just tell myself relax 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 and i you know it worked for a couple of uh couple percentage it brought it down But then when I was doing the biofeedback um, for myself, because Uh I was learning biofeedback, something that was very interesting is that the words didn't really matter. The minute I visualized, for example, just being in a calm and a beautiful place, like a happy, safe place for myself, that brought it dramatically down Uh the stress um, and the panic that I had, it brought it down. But all of these things were still a concept of the person creating that safe space in their head. But I think that what I liked about what you said is adding the piece of the love and nurturance of that yeah. another human being that we have, because that piece creates that oxytocin, the just creating this visualization of safety 
uh, it might bring their stress level down, but it doesn't necessarily pour the hormone of oxytocin, which calms you more and it creates that fulfilling. But the envisionment of that um, that memory is really good. Now, if you could tell our audience and um, our listeners about uh, unconscious procedural memory, yeah. because that's what you're actually your method is using. Yeah. And let me kind of explain what that is. Most people say, what the heck is unconscious yeah. procedural memory? But anybody who drives uses it all the time. When you first learn to drive, you got to be very, very focused on what you're doing. And it's still difficult. But as you learn it, part of what you're doing is being absorbed and memorized. And then finally, everything about driving is memorized. And it's built into what we call unconscious procedural memory, which is a huge has a huge ability to memorize things. And then now gets us becomes we become efficient because yeah, of this. Yeah. And and for example, I mean for example, a tennis serve is extremely complex. You can't do it consciously. You have to keep doing it in pieces until you can put all the pieces together and then let unconscious procedural memory do it for you. But anyway, um once we have any task built in there, even when we're under stress, unconscious procedural memory can perform it. Sometimes they say people who do high stress jobs like uh, working in an emergency room or a policeman or fireman, you don't rise to the occasion when there's an emergency in a high stress situation. You descend to the level of your training because under high stress, you're thinking doesn't work very well. Um, if you go back to Dots and Yerkes, way back in, I think, 1908 at Harvard, they found that you get some stress hormones that help sharpen you, a little bit more sharpens you, but then you reach a plateau, more doesn't get you better. But if you keep getting more stress, finally you fall off the cliff and you have <laughs> no cognition left. And that's where we are when we may have panic. So what do we, what can, what can intercept that panic except something that works unconsciously and unconscious procedural memory is not troubled by the stress hormone, so it can kick in and take care of us. So what we do is we go through the steps, training, well, let's say, for example, an MRI. A lot of people have trouble with MRIs. Yes. So you might say, what's the first thing about the MRI that could get you going, thinking about taking one? So let's say that you have a friend who you're thinking of who you feel really comfortable with, and they're holding a photograph of an MRI by their face. So they're, you're linking the, the thought of taking an MRI to their face. Then you might want to link uh, images by their face of getting in your car and going to the facility. Then maybe another picture of arriving and then checking in, going into a room where you change into a gown. Then being invited to lie down on the machine. How nice. And then you start thinking about going through the machine so you want some pictures of what that's like. And if and it's your so mate, you can this... even imagine them being in the machine with you. <laughs> <laughs> you could try it. But that's not probably going to come out in realism. Realist, uh, realistically <laughs> enough. So uh, you could say you take your mate, let's say if your mate is calming, and link all those things that are going to happen to you and to their face, to the quality of their voice, because you also, after you link it to their face, you want to have a conversation with them about it. So the voice gets connected to the MRI trip. And then while you're having the conversation, they just put an arm around you and give you a hug. So you get the face, the voice, and touch connected to step by step by step, all of the experience of the MRI. And that becomes the uh, procedural memory where then you could carry that because you linked the positive emotions to the negative thing that you think it is, the vision that you have. And now you're linking it. You're constantly keeping yourself safe. This is a way you consistently keep yourself safe. Well, it's kind of, it, it, you say positive memory, but what I'm thinking of it is it's the three things that activate the calming system. You want the three things that activate the calming system to be linked to the challenge, mm -hmm. and that's face, voice, and touch. Face, voice, and touch. Those yes. are the three things that you want to bring into the vision and attach it to whatever it is going you're going through that you think at that moment is not um, is not safe and is dangerous. 
So, yes, so we can link it to something we know we're going to do. But sometimes we get hit with stress unexpectedly. So what I'd suggest a person can do, and listeners can just take this and go with it, for the next few days, instead of trying to keep stress out of mind, look for it so you can pick up pick it up at the lowest possible threshold. And immediately, before you do anything else, imagine your best friend just walked in the door, says hello to you, comes over and gives you a hug. So do you see you get the face when they come in the door? You get the voice when they say hello to you, that special quality of the voice when they greet you, and they come over and give you a hug. So there's the touch. Now, if this happens, if if today you have, you have enough stress that you get to practice this six or eight times, same thing tomorrow, in just two or three days, this is going to become a program. So that every time you get revved up, you get calmed down. So let me ask you something. So yeah. if somebody already has uh, had an experience and it created panic for the first mm -hmm. time, and then mm -hmm. usually they have panic attack over panic attack, because yeah. if yeah. once they, one person had had a panic attack, the rest of it is going to be the fear of the panic of attack the panic that attack. keeps showing up. So one of the ways that your uh, book works, everyone, panic free. Mm -hmm. The 10 day program to end panic, anxiety, and claustrophobia by Tom Bunn. This is who we're talking to. Um, if uh, in your book it talks about the 10 steps that you could go systematically and practice this before the next panic attack, before the next time you're going to go face, for example, the um, of you know, flying or going into the MRI or going into a situation that creates yeah. that. And um, but if someone finds themselves in the middle of a panic attack, so it's not uh, it's not your regular uh, mm -hmm. symptoms that you know you you know it's not your regular phobias that you actually know what you're afraid of, but a generalized anxiety that turns into a generalized panic where the yeah. person just panics without knowing what's coming coming on. Yeah. How would you tell our listeners and audience to handle and take your techniques? to that panic attack? Well, our lab has been at 30,000 feet. <laughs> <laughs> People who I've been working with, experimenting with, and this is what we've been doing for quite some time. When we do the linking exercise, and we're talking about panic, as you know, just thinking about it can get you kind of revved up, maybe even yes. cause a panic attack. So we use cartoons. Cartoon characters get into terrible situations that they we can't see any way they could get out of them. And yet they do. There are no, so far as I know, dead cartoon characters. So <laughs> what we do is we take those main things that people feel in panic and so that pounding heart doesn't lead to hyperventilation, which leads to sweatiness, which leads to derealization or whatever. We want to take each of those elements as if it's a completely separate entity and link it up using it's as it's as this as if it's in the experience of the cartoon character so for example pounding heart clark kent gets on an airplane in his business suit looking like a nerd with his glasses on <laughs> and he's thinking hey if anything happens to the plane no problem i'll just become superman and grab the plane and put it on the ground and everybody will say how wonderful i am you know i kind of think I, I hate to say this, but I hope something goes wrong with the plane so I can show off. <laughs> so so he gets on the plane all confident. But when the plane takes off, suddenly he goes into a state of panic because he realizes he can't become Superman. All of his powers have been stripped out of him because someone on the plane has kryptonite on them. So he starts to panic. Well, let's say he has the whole thing. But use him for pounding heart because cartoonists – show pounding heart with big red exclamation marks drawn on the chest so he's got a blue business suit on so it's perfect just to put those red marks on his business suit and then alongside the chest they put some vertical lines spaced slightly apart a couple on each side to kind of show the chest is expanding contracting you've probably seen this in the cartoons mm -hmm. and so the idea is that's that's your cartoon superman clark can't actually having a panic attack because he can't become super so you put that cartoon by the face of your friend, right mm -hmm. by them. So you link it to their safety signals. Mm -hmm. There's poor Clark Kent having a terrible time. Then talk it over with your friend. 
And then while you're talking it over, they give you a hug. Mm. Okay, now we go to hyperventilation. For that, we use Popeye. You'll see why in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Popeye gets on the plane or in the wherever it is, and he starts to get edgy, but he's a macho guy. He doesn't want to blow his cover and let uh, olive oil, who's with him, to realize how <laughs> what a wimp he is, really. So <laughs> he figures... Better have a can of spinach, reaches into his pocket, fumbles around, can't find the spinach, reaches deeper in, and he realizes, oh, no spinach. His hand goes out the bottom of his pocket. It's lost. So now he starts to panic, and he hyperventilates. Now, he's blown his cover, so he now needs to turn to Olive and get some help. What else can he do? <laughs> so he wants to show her what's going on. So he takes his hand and puts it on his on his long skinny neck, his huge fist on his long skinny neck, and he starts to say, Olive, I'm having trouble breathing, but he's getting t more and more tense, so it comes out, Olive, I can't breathe. <laughs> so there's your cartoon. So you put that by your friend's face mm -hmm. and then talk it over and then get a hug. Mm -hmm. And yeah, well, I still like that. It's amazing. Uh, what I'm hearing from you is that panic attack overall um, is the state of imagination where it takes itself into a very dangerous zone. So yeah. you use the same imagination force that the person is using mm -hmm. toward negativity and danger and bringing it, one, making it into the cartoon figure where it minimizes the type of... Uh, morbidity or yeah. uh, the significance of it and mm -hmm. that it brings it into a comedy it brings it into humor and lightness and then you add that to the figure of love affinity uh connection by yeah. the the face the voice and the touch and in that way you're bringing these two together so for that person to be able to deactivate their body in a way that they're calm and hold their imagination into mm -hmm. a beautiful place until the panic is done and they actually can look at reality um, as is versus what they made it to be. Exactly. Exactly. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So um, last Words mm -hmm. for people. What is the most important thing that a person in the midst of panic attack needs to know? At that point, it doesn't matter. <laughs> There's not anything you can do. You've got no cognition to, to use. The best thing you can do is when you come out of it, say, I don't want to do this again. Okay. What I need to do to not panic is to get my unconscious procedural memory to take care of me when I am fried cognitively Beautiful. i've got to train it yeah i've got to train it where to where can people find you <laughs> and your book panic free the 10-day program to end panic anxiety and claustrophobia this is an amazing book actually the irony of this is i was reading it through while I was on a flight to Seattle. <laughs> yeah. And it was a beautiful read. It's easy read. It has amazing exercises. Uh, Tom takes you to step by step in how to go through this book and practice it. And it's really, really awesome. Tom, where can people find you? Well, you can get it on Barnes & Noble, on Amazon, or my website is panicfree.net. Beautiful. Thank you so much for coming to my show. And uh, and I learned a lot from your book and I'm going to use it in my ah, office with good. my clients. I love this part. I'm definitely going to add that piece to what I already do. And for all of you who were with us, create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you, especially now you've learned a panic-free one. Talk to you guys next week. Bye-bye.